Um, first, I want to say thank you for everybody who joined us today. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces and some new faces as well. I'm here joined uh, by um, four of my colleagues here that I'd like to try and uh, just recognize here. If you don't mind just raising your hands uh, in the back there, we have Taylor Korf, our VP of R&D, and Corey Lithberg, our VP of uh, Business Development out of uh, Chicago. Uh, we have Catherine, who actually is responsible for all the logistics of the event today. Woo! Catherine. Yeah. 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 And I'm also joined by Richard Schwartz, who is helping us here out of the New York office. Um, and I'm Eris Katz, the CEO and co-founder of the Center Research. <clears throat> so, um, just to get kind of the lay of the land, if I may ask a few questions. How many of you um, are quants in the audience? Okay, I see a few hands. Um, how many are data scientists? Same people. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Uh, how many are data, um, data companies, data source companies? Wow, nice representation of data yes. providers. And how many are buy side investment professionals or somehow affiliated with buy side okay great and how many are in the others category uh, corporate america government and students all right we have a few of those as well so it's great to see a diverse group of people um, it should be a lot of fun you know i'm trying to tailor the presentation to make it very um, generic and high level uh, because uh, we can definitely go in different tangents here, and we have a fantastic group of experts uh, that are just like me uh, in this amazing uh, revolution of data science and machine learning. Uh, we are in a transformational time in our lives. You guys know it. That's why you're here. Um, our team here, including myself, have been fighting this battle for years, for the last five years at least, from my company's perspective. And we've seen the market changing, changing in a very favorable way, favorable way towards what we have been preaching all along. Uh, you know, there was a famous uh, German um, um, philosopher named uh, Arthur Schopenhauer, who says that every truth has to go through three phases. Uh, the first phase is uh, complete uh, ridiculed and denial. The second one is violently opposed, and the third one is uh, self-evident. And we are, my friends, at a stage of self-evidence of the quality that big data and machine learning can bring to this world, not just in investment, to our everyday life uh, and to corporate America, which we see um, as a company getting more and more interest from our, our customer base. So uh, my dear friends, you know, uh, big data and AI is uh, transforming. Uh, it's coming uh, to become uh, very um, interesting uh, for many, many of you, many of our clients as well. But there's still that challenge of getting massive and easy adoption. It's just, I have to tell you, you know, I don't have people sending out my, out my door in my office waiting to buy our products. It takes some effort, some convincing, some uh, defensible back testing, simulation, model portfolios, uh, live portfolios to show people the true value. And uh, today, I want to have with my colleagues here, my friends here, an honest discussion, a true stories of success. And we want to tell you really what's happening in the industry. Uh, this is going to be um, not a sale process. We're not going to try to sell you on our offerings, but really tell you what we see down in the trenches happening every day, and why we strongly believe that we are in the midst of an incredible revolution that just got started. Okay, one of the biggest obstacles for adoption is what? What do you think is the biggest obstacle for somebody to say, you know what, I'm gonna start using tomorrow a big data source that looks pretty predictive and a machine learning engine that can give me a signal? What is the biggest obstacle for adoption? How do I do it? Integration. Testing? Yes, definitely. But also, mm -hmm. what I see, explainability. You know, it's very mm -hmm. hard to explain when you try to right. funnel millions of data points into a single black box that takes all these data points and comes up with a solution. How do you know, and how do you explain to your colleagues 
or to your constituents, what specific factor was a dominant factor that made a decision to buy or sell a stock? And if you cannot explain it to your peers, you cannot defend it, and therefore you will be more reluctant to adopt it. This is what we've been facing for the last few years. The good news is market is turning around because people have realized some things are not easily explainable. However, if I can understand the process by which the machine makes a decision, maybe it'll be easier for me to feel more comfortable with those decisions. And today, I'm gonna to give you, in my five minutes of opening remarks here, a quick explanation of how the machine actually works. How do we, at Lucena, identify and classify signals for uh, buying and selling constituents um, using multiple orthogonal validated and predictive data. And then I'm gonna put the uh, um, earnest on my colleagues here, tell you their side of the story because I'm only gonna be one of, uh, of five to uh, respond to questions and actually have a very meaningful open conversation with you guys. So I want you guys to continue and ask questions as we go along. So let me just start by telling you, uh, by doing this, this little thing here. I have this video that I came about that I'm going to play now that kind of tells a story about how machine learning works, how deep learning works. This is a very uh, simple example of the MNIST database, which is a handwritten digit database. How a machine classifies a handwritten uh, digit, which is a very simple problem to solve for machine learning classifier. There's about uh, over two million neurons that actually are participating in the decision that's being made here. Now if you think about it, a simple problem trying to be solved by machine learning, deep learning technology using multiple points of information of data all to, to create a very simple output. What is the handwritten digit? Is it number nine, number five, number six, whatever that, that may be. Now it's amazing to me that a baby can detect an object with just a few observations. And we need to feed millions of data points, millions of samples, a huge infrastructure to just classify what is a handwritten digit. So there is definitely a disconnect and a lot of head, um, I guess, some, some more um, progress to be made as to really create a computer vision classifier that can be equal to the accuracy and the speed of the human brain. However, even with that small progress, we can make some amazing stuff into how do we make decisions that are surpassing the human capacity. Let me explain why. In retrospect, what's happening behind the scene when you saw all these neurons getting lit up and moving from one layer to the other, an image can be broken down to multiple pixels. Each pixel represents a number some kind of a coefficient that can be multiplied and represent the layer of these uh, neurons, which is the pixels, at any given time. One layer responsible for edges, the other one puts the edges together, the third one puts all the edges into partial shapes, and at the end of the game, you can see, okay, I'm very close numerically, quantifiably, to the number nine, and therefore I'm classifying nine with high probability. Okay, that's the idea behind computer vision or deep learning network. Now taking that very same concept and going with the concept of convolutional neural network, which we take a very complex image and break it down to multiple layers of uh, information, of channels, you basically simplify the image in the very same fashion, trying to downsize that complexity to allow the machine to identify, okay, there's a beak, shape of a beak, shape of, a, of an eye, there's a feather, there's a tail, okay, it's probably a bird, and therefore I can classify a bird on the output. And that's kind of how it works in the real world. This is not new. It's been out in production by autonomous vehicles, Facebook tagging, whatever you name it, it's, it's happening. It's not something that we just invented today. The question is, can we take the very same concept and apply to the, machine, the same machine learning classifier to detect stock predictions? And the answer is yes. The very same image you saw before that has multiple channels of a very complex picture of a bird can actually have an image that's equivalent to create the state of a stock in a given time. So you train the machine just to get multiple time series. These are all predictive data sets that have been validated before. 
it's time series, which means it's point in time over time in history. And you put those together, and you can say, hey, when all these stars lined up just perfectly, that's when we had a buy signal. And you start to look back with the machine and train it. This is a condition that made a buy. This is what made a good sale. And over time, all these multiple layers of information put together can create that classifier for the machine learning. And that's how we use machine learning to identify the forecast. Now you think about it, it's pretty much how our brains work when we do our spreadsheet, because we have multiple columns that describe you know, the P ratio, the EBITDA, the analyst consensus, these are all predictive data points. And essentially, we are going to um, create the very same concept by using an automated, smart way to identify historically what works, what had worked in the past with the assumption that the same condition will basically drive the future. Now, this has been working for us. I'm not making it up. This is just has been working really well. And I'm going to just close my intro with, uh, with one more statement. Um, our company has not um, sat down on that exploration and said, okay, it's working re really great. They're just going to sit down and start um, you know, relaxing. We kept evolving to create additional um, technologies. For example, we found a way to uh, take those time series pictures and make a two-dimensional representation of those same images. It's easier for the machine to classify. And then we went with a much more advanced technology called a capsule network for the quants here. Happy to talk to you about that offline. Actually, Taylor is here in the back. We can talk to you about it as well. These are more advanced ways of identifying not just uh, pieces of, uh, of, of, of object detection, but also how they relate to each other in the past and uh, how, uh, uh, how accurate they were uh, you know, from positioning and contextualization perspective, which is definitely one of the issues that is uh, holding us back with the typical convolutional neural network. But anyway, I'm not going to get to that specific. What I wanted to tell you about is that all of that, and that's where I'm going to go into the panel here, all of that doesn't really matter. No matter how smart your engine is, no matter how sophisticated your machine learning algorithms are, the data is the bloodline of AI. If you don't have predictive data, you will not be successful. And to be successful with data, you have to know how to, number one, validate it, Number two, mobilize it in a way that the machine can understand how it can be used effectively to predict uh, whatever that may be that you were trying to predict. This is a tricky business, not for everyone. You have to have the right skill set. I'm so honored to be with folks here today that have those kind of skill sets, that have the experience, and I'm willing to, I'm willing to share with you, along with me, uh, their success stories in the industry. With that, I'm going to uh, pass the podium, uh, actually the microphone, to uh, John Neitzel, uh, a friend, number one, uh, someone I respect uh, tremendously from his experience and knowledge. Uh, John uh, is the founder of Unreal uh, Partners, um, and before that he's been in 18 years in the technology or financial services from being a portfolio manager, and uh, obviously more recently uh, served as a chief data officer at Goldman Sachs uh, for the fundamental equity. So John will be the moderator and he will introduce the other um, panel panelists. Thank you so much. Thanks, Russ.